welcome you uh, to time of worship as we come. For some of us, 2022 has already been too long. <laughs> for some of us, we're still very hopeful and expectant. Um, and as we come to worship, I, I wanted to read from actually a psalm where the Israelites are suffering. And it comes from Psalm chapter 66, verse 8 and 9. In the middle of this psalm, it says, Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Lord, we come to you this morning. Lord, some of us expectant, hopeful. Some of us, Lord, just thankful that you're preserving us. And wherever we are this morning, Lord, you're calling us to worship you. You're calling us to praise your name because you are a strong tower. You are hope. No matter in success or defeat, in broken dreams or fulfilled dreams, you are our everything. So would you come? Be pleased with the worship that we bring to you. Help us, Holy Spirit, to prepare our hearts to meet with you, to commune with you, to relate with you, and to honor you this day. We pray in your name. If you're able, please stand with us.
Yeah.
just want to give us a moment. Uh, know the Lord that his Lord is here. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says, Here I am. Jesus is speaking. I stand and knock. If you will open the door, I will come in. And I will fellowship with you. Jesus is here. In the idea of love, he he's pursued us. He's, he's died on the cross for us. He's paid the way. But he will not force his way into our hearts. So take a moment and open our hearts to him. That we will let him come in and that we would fellowship with him. For some of us, in the previous verse, in verse 8, Jesus says, those I love, I discipline. And I call to repentance. So maybe some of us, we need to confess our sins. Some of us, we need to repent and turn to the Lord. And then let him in. And he will come and meet with us. Just take a moment.
In fact, you are orchestrating and working in our lives for your purpose and for your glory, not for ours. So Lord, whatever you need to do this morning, we open the door and we ask, Lord, have your way in us. Help us to understand the calling that you're placing on us individually and as a church. Help us to understand what you are asking to, us to do and help us to boldly and faithfully live it out today. And as we turn to your word, Lord, we turn our ears and our hearts. Lord, we do not give the devil a foothold. Come and speak to us and transform us by the renewing of our minds by your word. We pray for Pastor Brad that you would anoint him, fill him with your power and your spirit today, that we would not see him, we would not hear him, but that we would meet with you and that we would reciprocate the love that you have for us back to you by trusting and obeying you. So come, minister to us as only you can. Be glorified here in this space and place. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Happy New Year. Good morning. Good morning. All right, great. Thanks for the response. Uh, usually at 9 o'clock, it takes some time to wake up, so people, you know, it takes them a little while to respond. But um, I'm, like, so excited to launch this series. Um, I titled this series uh, Expansion X2, like X-Men 2, uh, because uh, what we're going to see is... Um, Apostle Paul going on another missionary trip. And that's what we're going to observe in this series, the second missionary journey of Apostle Paul, starting from the end of the book of Acts, chapter 15. Now, I don't know if you recall, last year, about September, we launched the series, the first part, really, of this series called Expansion. And we covered the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And it was really amazing because he went out, right, with Barnabas, he had nothing but the Word of God and faith and this call to the Great Commission to make disciples. And he established four more churches as he came back. And you open up Andrew chapter 15, you expect Paul to be satisfied. But he's not. He goes back out. And then establishes not only churches in Asia Minor, but also in Europe this time. That's something that he never really expected. So as we launch this series, I call this first part of this sermon series uh, the new beginning. Because as he goes out in his second missionary journey, Acts 2, what you're going to see is that he's going to have a new partner. Barnabas is no longer going to be his partner. He's going to establish uh, new disciples. Very next chapter, he's going to meet Timothy, and he's going to be his lifetime disciple. And he's going to go into a new area. It's really interesting because he goes out because he's concerned about the disciples in Asia Minor, the churches that he has established, the four churches. Yet he has a dream from a man from Macedonia, and he goes into all the way into Europe. In fact, majority of second, his second missionary journey becomes the part where he had a dream in Europe. And I thought for our church, this is a great series because we had just expanded, right? After September, I call that series the most effective series we've ever launched because there were many disciples that responded. I think we have close to 25 new disciples who became a disciple, and they, were, they want to grow further into mature disciples. And we started another church at UIC in the midst of the pandemic. And I, I, wanted, I thought it would apply to our church because I, I, don't, I don't want us to believe that that's where we're going to stop. I was talking to my daughter, and my daughter was like, hey, Dad, you know, I know you want to go on, uh, away on sabbatical this summer, but maybe you should stay home because we just started a church. And I said, daughter, if you don't want to come, you don't have to come. But remember, we're going to plant churches every year. We're going to expect every year because we are a church focusing upon the Great Commission, and we, by faith, that we believe that as disciples grow, that they will multiply, and we believe in church planting. So we open up to Acts chapter 15, and I have to give you a little bit of background because you know, right? Book of Acts is a historical book about the first church, right? How the church began in Acts chapter 2. So more than 3,000 men plus women and children as a result of the apostles' preaching. A church was established by Acts chapter 9. There was persecution from the outside, and disciples are all over Judea, Samaria, and into Asia Minor. And then they established this church 
in Antioch, the first Gentile-centered church, right? Acts chapter 11, verse 19, right? Now those who have been scattered by the persecution, this is from Acts chapter 9, that broke out when Stephen was killed and traveled to Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. But notice here, some of them, however, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned out to the Lord. And what's really amazing is the first, the first time there is a church, a Gentile church. But that wasn't the only story. By chapter 13, this Gentile church had the audacity not only to just establish Antioch, but to go out into Asia Minor. Do you remember Acts chapter 13? Remember the first missionary journey, how it started? By the calling, right? Acts chapter 13, verse 1, right? Now in the church of Antioch, this is the Gentile church, there were prophets and teachers, right? Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manane, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. We know this is Paul, right? He changes his name in the middle of the first missionary journey, right? While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. We call this the greatest missionary team ever. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hand on them and sent them off. And during the missionary journey, this, this Gentile church sends out two missionaries into the Asia Minor. And they established no less than four churches. And then they come back and they celebrate. And then something else happens, right? As Acts chapter 15 there are certain men that's perverting the gospel. So Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, certain people came down from Judea and Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom made by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, you know, we, we have the benefit as a church to study, right? Book of Romans, we have established justification by faith. We just studied Genesis. We saw the life of Abraham, right? Abraham believed in God and was declared righteous. We know that we are justified. We are, uh, we, God treats us forensically and legally righteous because he gives that righteousness to us as a result of faith. This is, this is a, of utter importance. And there are these men, they're Jewish, right? They understand the Bible and they're coming in and they're putting in works, circumcision. And this is very dangerous. This is what I call the major. You cannot compromise on this because what happens if the disciples believe this, they're not going to grow anymore because they're going to go to works. And you know, as you know, none of us are made perfect. If we focus upon works, none are righteous. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that's why verse 2, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debated with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. They go to Jerusalem. All the leaders of the church come together and they settle it, right? They settled that, no, 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 Gentiles do not have to be circumcised or obey any of the Old Testament. No, righteous is just by faith alone. And then they come back, and then they're like, you know what? We got an issue because there's an issue in the church. There are these people, these Jews, well, let's call them, they, they were called Judaizers. They believed that Gentiles, because they were now Gentiles were growing within the church, although they were minority, they were kind of oppressed, and they were saying they have to also be circumcised, they have to obey, because we, the Jews, are the carriers, and we cannot negate all of our history. And so Paul and Barnabas decided to go out, and this is where it is, where we start our series in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Why? Because they want to make sure that the disciples are growing. They know if the gospel is perverted and infiltrated by works, righteousness, they know the disciples will never grow. And if disciples never grow, then the Great Commission stops. See, everything depends on the growth, the maturity of the disciples. And I tell you all the time, right, there's a difference between all of us are disciples, learners of God, but there are immature disciples. They're learning how to obey God. Mature disciples are what? We don't obey perfectly, but we obey. We obey God so well that it ultimately comes into our character. In fact, it's not something we do. It's who we are. It's an amazing thing to be, and it's sanctification. I know none of us ever really arrive, but we grow in, it, in space and time in a real way. There are disciples that grow into more, greater obedience. And in order for you to do that, you have to have right kind of doctrine, right kind of theology. You have to understand the Bible. It makes no sense if you believe that you can mature in Christ 
without understanding the Word of God. In fact, I would add that without the disciples, disciples, there's no way for you to mature. Verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John called Mark with them. This is the same Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark. I need to put that in there. And this is the same Mark that left them during the first missionary journey. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia. This is during the first missionary journey and had not continued to take them in the work, with them in the work. And there's such a sharp disagreement. Actually, the Greek word here, it, this is a serious uh, disagreement. No doubt they were frustrated and angry at one another. You, you, cannot, you cannot negate this word. There was such a disagreement. Notice what happens. They parted company. The greatest missionary team ever created split as a result of John Mark. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went to Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the church. Now today, as we observe, Apostle Paul expand again. Expansion 2x. I'm going to answer three questions that's going to help us to expand again. Now, first question we have to answer is what enables us to expand again? Because you open up, what we are seeing is Paul and Barnabas go right back into Asia Minor and begin to confront the false teachers that are infiltrating the church. And they know right away that unless they go out as disciples and mature disciples, that the movement of God will stop right here. There will be no more expansion, and there will be no more multiplication. They understand it. So now we can answer the question, what enables us to expand again? I think three things. One is devotion of the spiritually mature disciple to the Word of God. Because you read verse 36, and you ask this question, why was this necessary, right? Look at verse 36. Sometime later, Paul and Barnabas... But Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in the towns when we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now, verse 35 tells us that they were doing very well in Antioch. Verse 35 says, but Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. Now, you read this and you're like, why are they doing it? Churches are already established, right? We don't need to go out. Why do you need to confront? We'll just leave it and we'll let them handle it. You're already doing the things that you're already called. And you have to answer this question, and of course the answer is because they're devotion. They're devoted to the Word of God. And I, I need to say this, because some of you are reading this, and you're like, oh, second missionary journey was really started, not by the Spirit of God, but the mind of the disciples, right? Because do you remember first missionary journey? Remember Acts chapter 13, when it was started? Do you remember? Acts chapter 13, verse 2, while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called you. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hand on them and sent them off. We read this and you're like, see, they were devoted to the spirit, but here they're devoted to the mind and the word. No, 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 it's actually the same thing. Because you're going to see, Luke is not, the author is not negating the movement of the spirit. Because by Acts chapter 16, verse 6, he's going to talk about this movement. Acts chapter 16, verse 6 through 10 says, Paul and his companions tra traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. So what... Paul, what, what, what the author is doing, not negating the movement of the Spirit, but he's actually enjoy, conjoining the movement of the Spirit with the Word of God. In other words, mind has to work with the Spirit, and Spirit has to work with the mind. And if you want to really understand the movement of the Spirit, you have to understand the Word of God. Your devotion to the Word of God will tell you how you are devoted to the Spirit of God. In fact, Spirit of God will always agree and empower you to the Word. In fact, you can't even understand the Word without the Spirit. And what you have to understand, there's a devotion. They are devoted to the Word of God because they understand very clearly, and this is very important. This is why as a church, as a disciple-making church, we will always have a Bible study that studies the Bible. Because we understand that disciples cannot grow without understanding the Word of God. It is the very food of God. You know, I meet people all the time. They're like, you know, I'm not growing. I'm like, how's your devotion of time? And their response, there goes the legalist. But really, how are, how's your devotion of, how are you reading the Word? But for, for a disciple, without the Word of God, you cannot grow. In fact, you cannot continuously grow without further studying. In fact, you have to understand doctrine. You have to understand theology. You have to read more and more, more and more Word of God. You have to be taught further in order for you to grow. And if you stop, then expansion will stop and you'll stop replicating. You know, I talk about this all the time, that the most important thing a disciple can do is what? To replicate, right? To fulfill the Great Commission. If we know the disciple becomes mature and they can replicate, one disciple can change the world in 33 years. But if they stop and they begin to digress, and it really digression or backsliding is so powerful, right? Because once we start backsliding, some of us have been backsliding for 30 years. We can't grab, well, how do you come out of it? 
once again, I will tell you, by the study of the Word of God, by the movement of the Spirit in your life. So we're asking, what, expands, what enables us to expand again? It's the devotion of a spiritually mature disciple to the Word of God. And then second is the second D, which is determination of the disciple to the disciple's maturity. Now, what I need you to notice is that when you read this agreement, disagreement between this great missionary team, it's because they are determined to their disciples. Look at verse 37, right? Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. And Paul did not think it wise to take him because they had, he had deserted him in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. They had such a sharp disagreement, they parted company. I think it's a mistake to read this and we're like, hey, who's right, who's wrong? I think they're both right. But what I want you to know is that Paul is devoted to his disciples. He's determined for his disciples, disciples in Asia Minor. Do you remember after establishing four churches, what happened at the end of the first missionary journey? Do you remember? Acts chapter 14, verse 21, right? They preached the gospel to that city, and when the large number of disciples, when they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Notice what Paul says to them. Very important, because this, he is determined. What is he determined to? Perseverance of discipleship. Do you notice here? We must go through many hardship to enter the kingdom of God. And Paul is absolutely clear. He is one of these disciples who say, hey, suck it up and do it. Persevere. Without it, you will not grow. And you turn to Barnabas, and you're like, well, Barnabas doesn't care about personality. He does, but he cares about another thing, which is what? Grace. It's amazing because I read this, and so many years I wanted to be like Barnabas, and I'm not. I'm like Paul. I'm all about perseverance. But my wife, who is also very capable of this, she's really about woman of grace. And you realize Barnabas, right? Paul was disciple by Barnabas. Do you remember when Paul had that dramatic conversion in chapter 9? All the apostles were afraid of him. When he had converted, he had preached the gospel. It was Barnabas who defended him. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 26. One day he had come, this is Paul, to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Why? Because he was persecuting the church, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed, this is, we know this is Paul, stayed with them and moved freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. In fact, Barnabas was called to the first Gentile church called Antioch, and when he got there and he saw the move in his spirit, he went back and got, got Paul, his old disciple, back to Antioch. This is what it says in chapter 11, verse 25, right? Of book of Acts, right? Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found, this is when he was in obscurity. And he, we don't know what he was doing. He brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught a great number of people and disciples who are called Christians first at Antioch. You see, Barnabas is determined for his disciple, John Mark. And it's really amazing because what you are seeing is how each disciple is so different. One is so focused upon perseverance. And he knows, Paul knows, he has to go. And then when he goes out, he's going to be persecuted. Last time he was stoned almost to death. This time he's going to be jailed. He's going to be mobbed. And last thing he wants is the disciple who backs down. Barnabas looks at John Mark, and Barnabas is right in the sense that he knows that John Mark is developing. If they let go of John Mark here... He's not going to grow into maturity. He, we know, right? He goes with Barnabas. We don't really hear much about him, but eventually John Mark goes to Rome, gets discipled by Peter, and then he writes the first gospel called Mark, Gospel of Mark. And all the other gospel writers copy and use his source to write because he's the first one. And you realize Barnabas, right? But what I want you to notice is the determination. This is why, guys, it, it makes all the difference what kind of discipler you have, Right? Some disciples are determined for the gospel. Others are focused upon grace. Both of them, none of them are wrong. They, 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 they just, it's, it's a combination of the disciples. You know if I have disciples, you, you know I always say suck it up and do it. Please don't tell me, right? I was talking to my, uh, my wife about my posse, and then she's like, which one? And I was like, you, you know the posse. And I wasn't even talking about the little girls that pray. You know, on Fridays I pray, and then there's these little girls that Five foot and under, they, I don't know how they got there, but they just pray. When I pray, they all pray. My daughter, like, comes in between. We just all pray together. And then I tell them all the time, hey, if tough things happen, suck it up. And they, they grow. 
And I was like, I wasn't talking about that posse. I was talking about the other posse, these guys who are married to those little girls and who's always trying to save money on credit card. And because they follow me with credit card, they're trying to talk to me about saving money. Because these little girls are really passionate, but they're not always the best at saving money. I don't know if I help any of those guys save money and grow in Christ. I actually don't know that. We just talk and we just talk about saving money because we're cheap and we like to save money. But what I want you to notice is that you have to be determined and you have to have grace. I was at a Friday Bible study, one of my disciples. I was so proud of her teaching the Bible, inductive Bible study. And one of the things we were being taught was sanctification, that in sanctification we have been crucified with Christ, right? Because we die to ourselves, we are alive to Christ. And one of the things that we're discussing is, hey, we should not be struggling with sin because we live in sanctification. We are dead to sin. Of course, we ask the question, why do some of us struggle with sin? Actually, I asked that question. Some of us are Christians, but we still struggle with sin. And it's amazing, right? When I first became a Christian, right? My addiction to drugs, right? I used to do a lot of drugs. God took it away like that. My addiction to cigarettes were a little bit different. Still, another couple of years, I had to like hold on to a pole in order for me to quit. God didn't take away it right away. Somebody were to ask me, hey, Brad, how did you quit drugs? I really don't have any advice for them. I just say pray because that's how God took it away. But if someone asks, how do you quit smoking? I actually can give them a lot of advice. So I struggled with that. I mean, first thing I would say is don't smoke menthol because it's more addictive than the regular kind. And then, yes, sometimes you really have to hold on to a pole, especially after you eat because, you know, I don't know why. Those people that smoke, I, I know you guys, you, you don't need to know any of this, but I don't know why. After you eat a meal, you want to smoke. I don't know what, what it is about this nicotine and food and whatever. Well, I know it because I struggle through it. Now, I told that story because I wanted you to know that sometimes God allows us to struggle through sin so that, well, we would help other people. I think we always think that we're so isolated. No, no, no. If you look at it in the terms of the Great Commission and discipling, you realize even the sins that God remains in sanctification, God will use greatly. It's not, that's why I always say there are no heroes among us, right? We are all sinful. None of us arrive at sanctification, but we can be sure that if we are walking truthfully in sanctification, we are growing. So theology does matter. Doctrine does matter. Study of the Word of God matters. It matters. And one of the things that really matters is the determination of the disciples, disciples, who will help us to grow into maturity. That, that's what it matters, and that's what you're seeing. Because if we're going to expand again, it's the determination of the disciples, discipling the disciples to maturity. I know some of us, like people like me that are determined, sometimes you know, you look at disciples and they don't want to grow, and then I, I just let them go. It's just my character, because I know what it takes to be a disciple. Even if you gave everything that you have, it's hard for you to be a disciple. And then my wife always says, you're really harsh, right? Because she's a woman of grace. She sees possibilities again and again. I'm like, hey, you need to do that. That's what you're seeing. What you are seeing here and what we are understanding is that if we're going to expand again, you need the determination of the disciples to their disciples' maturity. And then there's one more, dedication by the disciples for the unity in diversity. Now, I, I need to say this because, um, you know, our church is growing and I, people come to our church and then they're, they, they're saying, well, I don't like this, I don't like that. Notice verse 39, okay? Uh, Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the church. And do you notice here? They are divided, but they are unified. They are, in other words, one focuses upon more on grace, so it's going to be more individual-centered. The other one is more determined. He's going to plant a lot of churches, but they're unified. In fact, what you'll see... Paul does. Paul never speaks against Barnabas or Mark. He never speaks against. In fact, Colossians chapter four, verse ten. That you. That's when you find out. Actually, John Mark is really a cousin of Barnabas. This is what Paul says. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Notice here what he says. You, you have received instruction about him, and if he comes to you, welcome him. You realize there's still unity. Now, I want to just tell you because it's very important. If you want to be unified, okay, you want to be dedicated to unity in diversity, you have to understand the majors and minors. 
This is why theology, doctrine really matters. You have to understand what major is. You notice here, Paul and Barnabas is going out, confronting the Judaizer. Why? Because the word of God is at stake. It's a major. You can't compromise on it. No, gospel cannot be watered down. Gospel cannot be deterred. Gospel is what it is by faith that man is justified. And faith alone. Gospel cannot be perverted or watered down or apologized. Gospel is what it is. You defend the word of God. That's a major. Methodology of discipleship, whether we focus upon grace more than determination or perseverance, that's a minor. In other words, you can still differ and still be unified. Spiritual gifts, I know some people are like, well, you know, Brad, you know, you speak in tongues. I, 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 you know, I don't think I can deal with that. I'm like, really? That's a minor. I never teach that everyone has to speak in tongue. I never say that, you know, uh, speaking in tongue is sin. No, 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 no. The Bible is very clear about speaking in tongue. But some people don't speak in tongue. In fact, some people don't like speaking in tongue. I get it. Some people love speaking in tongue. And there should be interpreters, right? And then there are, you know, people stand and they're like, well, you know, you're speaking in tongue. There are no interpreters. Well, the context is worship, service. And if you want an interpreter, if you don't have someone who speaks in tongue, how will you ever get an interpreter to understand? So in prayer meetings, there are times when you're allowed to do that so that other people who have gift can also see. In fact, how do you receive tongue, you have gift of tongue, if you never can speak it without an interpreter? Have you ever thought about that? Because it's a new experience. I don't know why. Like four or five weeks straight, somebody received tongue as I pray over them. I don't know why. It just happened, including my daughter. But if you don't speak tongue with them, how do they develop tongue? How do they receive it? Is it a supernatural? You close your eyes. Try it. It won't work. But that's still minor. Woman in the church. I have to talk about this. This church is growing. We're like, oh, you know, we, we just cannot support women in the church. I'm like, really? 1 Timothy chapter 2, right? Allow no woman to teach. Okay. How are you going to explain? Paul's going to go on in second missionary journey. He's going to meet a couple, Priscilla and Aquila. And they're going to teach, and they're going to teach as a couple. And they're going to teach Apollos, one of the great teachers. How are you going to explain? Paul doesn't say, hey, you're a woman, don't teach. They're like, no, 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 no. You can teach, but not to men you can't. Anyone who's 18 years older. Really? In my custom, I'm, I'm from Korea. We are from Confucian culture. You're not really a man until you get married and have a child. You see, church history has always struggled with this issue. But it doesn't split the church. You don't accuse one another not believing in the word of God. Do you understand? You have to understand majors and minors if you want to be unified in diversity. Very important. You do not hold all of the truth. In fact, I just want to tell you this about women. I'm still working on it. I've been studying this subject. so many, I've read every, I'm not going to say every because it sounds airy. I've read a, lot, read a lot of book, and it's a struggle. I do believe that there's an authority issue. I do believe that husbands lead in the household. But when it comes to women in church, I believe women are allowed to t- teach. Ordination, that's another issue altogether. That's an authority issue, so you have to kind of work it out. It's a much more... But what I want to tell you, it's a, if you want to be unified as a church, you have to understand unity and diversity. God created us differently. And just because it, you differ a little bit in the minor, that doesn't mean you divide. Even then, you should pray it through. You should talk it out. Do you notice here? Because I, I need you to understand this. Do you notice here? Right? They had such a sharp disagreement. You know, they talked it out. There were things that they can work out. There were things that they could now. You talk it out. You don't just say, hey, you believe this, I believe that, I'm going <laughs> to. I don't understand. If you're committed, if, you want, if, you're, if you're dedicated to unity and diversity, you have to understand there has to be communication and there has to be grace and they have to understand, you have to understand majors and minors. Word of God cannot be compromised. But you have to understand when different people of different tradition will come together, there will be discussions. Even about discipleship. We have a certain way of discipling. And some of the disciples come, hey, I don't like it that way. Well, okay, that's too bad. This is what we have chosen. This is what we have studied. This is what we have worked for us. And I told you, there is no disciple that comes in and tells the discipler, you disciple me. This, it doesn't work. The process does not work. And let me tell you, if you're a discipler and you're giving in to your disciple and doing what they're telling you to do, you miss the whole point. The point is they will be frustrated and have difficulty because you're teaching them something that they don't want to know or they don't know yet. 
Yeah, so you're like, well, the discipleship is too hard for me. Then I don't want to do it. Yeah, well, you're not devoted. You're not dedicated to unity and diversity because without discipleship, this person will not walk in sanctification and maturity. You see, expand, she, see, in order for you to expand, you need devotion, determination, and dedication. So we're asking a question, right? What enables us to expand again? Three things. Devotion by the mature, mature disciples to the Word of God, right? Spirit of God. Determination of the disciple or to the disciple to maturity, right? And dedication of all believers to unity and diversity. And that's the answer to the second question. Why? Why do we need to practice these three Ds to expand again, right? And I... I have to say this, and you're like, here it goes, Mr. Obvious. Yeah, exactly, right? Let me give you two reasons. One is because disciples will not grow without, grow to maturity without it. In other words, if we don't go and we not devote ourselves, determine ourselves to disciples, and dedicate ourselves to unity, they won't grow. Now imagine, I need, I need to say this. Paul and Barnabas begin to argue, and they're like, well, because of that, I'm not going to do it anymore. Paul speaks against Barnabas. Barnabas speaks against Paul. These disciples are never, it's too hard for me. Do you remember? But no, no, no. Look at verse 3. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back, visit the believers in all the towns where they had preached the word of God and see how they are doing. They argue, they struggle, but they go out. Do you know why? Because they understand that in order for them to what? In order for the disciples to grow into maturity. If, if what happens when a disciple does not grow into maturity? You know exactly. Right? You know, there was a time. When I began to counsel people and I began to ask them, and it was really amazing because they would come into my office and I would ask them one question. Do you have one person in your life that have devoted their lives into you? And every person said no. And then I realized why they're not spiritually mature. You see, God has designed, right? What did Jesus do when he came? He made disciples, right? He invested into them so that the disciples would grow. Do you understand the power of discipleship? People are asking, well, how do you live sanctified? Well, you have to be discipled. There are so many things. You need someone who has walked ahead of you. And then there are people that come. They're like, well, you know what? It'll all work out, right? My, I live in a generation, right? They say, hey, 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 hey unity. Hey, hey, don't, don't rub each other the wrong way. You know, if they disagree with you, just whatever, right? And we're, we're not dedicated, right? We're not devoted to the truth of the Word of God. But do, you, you ever notice here? Do you notice how how determined Paul and Barnabas are to the word that they know. Do you notice here? Do you know why? You also not only need a disciple, you also need someone to speak the truth of the word of God. Because without it, you're not going to grow into maturity. I was driving today, uh, this week, and then I was listening to a couple of songs from the 80s. And I always talk about Gen Xers, how we never re- re- achieved maturity. And I was listening to these songs, and I'm not going to tell you the author, okay? I'm just going to tell you the song. And then I realized why. Because we're the generation. We're like, don't rock the boat. You know, make sure everybody gets along, right? Hey, if you disagree, hey, be cool. I want you to listen to some of these songs. First one is titled, uh, People Need the Lord. I was, I was like, and you know, these are great authors, but I can't believe we, said, we sang these songs and became popular. It goes like this. Every day they pass by. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care. Headed, who knows where. And they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hiding their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. And then here's, like I couldn't believe it. I heard these songs in a row. People need the Lord. People know the, need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he is the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will they realize people need the Lord? I'm listening to this. I'm like, wait. Gospel is only for the people who lost their dreams? And we said this, but nobody confronted in the name of unity because, you know, we can't rock the boat, right? And then the second song came out, and I just, like, about lost it, right? It's, it's like, I commit my love to you. It's, it actually starts out really great. If by love we show the world that we are his disciples, I can take it lightly, commit, I commit my love to you. I will tear down all the walls I built with the selfish pride, and I will crucify it. I commit my love to you, and then... I mean, it blew me away. And then, because when we are divided, I can hear him crying. I said, really, God is crying because we are divided? And I can't take a part of breaking his heart anymore? I'm reading this, and I'm like, how does Psalm 115.3 work out in this song, right? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. In fact, there's one person, one being that's fully satisfied, fully content, above all, is God himself. Right? 
How does Romans 1 16, right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God and brings salvation to everyone, right? Everyone who believes, first the Jews, then the Gentiles. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteous that is by faith from first to last, just as written, righteous will live by faith. Now, I need, I need you to understand this, guys, because sometimes you have to be devoted to the word of God. And sometimes you have to rub each other the wrong way for the truth of the Word of God. Because disciples will not grow. You have to take the Word of God and the movement of the Spirit very seriously. And then there are sometimes you're determined. You cannot agree with someone because you're determined for the life of the disciples. Those little people that pray, pray, pray behind me, I'm so concerned for them. I pray for them. I walk with them. Why? Because I understand. If I'm not determined for them as their disciples, they will fall away. I understand it. And then all of us have to what? We have to be dedicated to unity. We can't speak against one another because we disagree. Sometimes God doesn't show us everything. None of us know everything. We're asking why. Why do we have to devote ourselves to these three Ds? One is because disciples are not mature. And then let me give you another reason. Because the Great Commission will not be fulfilled. I say this to my staff all the time. Guys, focus, focus. When we go to like sushi taco and they're like, like they get overwhelmed with sushi and, you know, and Phil, Phil Kwan like orders more pieces than I can eat. And then, you know, I'm like, guys, focus. There's only so much we can eat. Focus, focus. Well, I want us to focus. I know we've been through, you know, the holidays. Guys, we are a disciple making church. We are a church that seeks to fulfill the Great Commission. When so, when disciples don't want to do discipleship, we let them go. And then when disciples are struggling, they're going through pain, yet they want to do disciples, we devote and determine ourselves to the discipleship. Notice what Jesus says, very important, verse 18, right? Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And notice he said, you cannot get around to this. What does it mean to disciple, to be a learner, to do what? And teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. Sanctification. You cannot skip this out. And it would, it would seem to me, if you're a church that's devoted to the Great Commission, you would understand the importance. In other words, you have to teach them to obey everything. How can you obey God? Even in your own strength, you cannot. You have to depend upon Him. But you already know, right? Unless you devote all, in other words, in Great Commission, unless the disciple is fully for it. They, they can be broken. They don't have to be smart. They don't have to be, have any, any, anything but faith. But if, unless they're fully devoted, you cannot fulfill the Great Commission. That's why Paul is going out with devotion determination. That's why he's dedicated, because he understands that unless you're fully committed to discipleship, you will not. But if you are fully, the movement cannot be stopped. Do you notice here, Acts 15, verse 39, right? They had such sharp disagreement, they parted company. Barnabas took Paul and went out on mission to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left, commanded by the believers to the grace of our Lord, right? He went to Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the church. Do you notice here? They go out to, why? Because they have a vision. They know it very clearly. And let me remind you, if you are, if we are a church that focuses upon vision, it's about faith. It's about believing what God's going to do as we focus on what he tells us to do. I was telling the staff that I was really excited last Sunday when this service didn't have a lot of people. Over there in UIC, it was full, but they never, I was really actually more concerned for UIC because we need empty seats in order for people to come. And I wasn't worried about here because God's going to fill it. Why? Because we are a disciple-making church. We see it by faith, not by sight. We believe when a disciple is capable of making disciples, that God will what? Draw all men. Why? Because most people want to. They have this desire within their heart, what? To know God, walk with God. And serve God. It's a privilege to be discipled. Why? Because you can change the world in 33 years. Do you know that any one of the disciples, if they go out, right? I talk about this in Discipleship 300 and 400. Right? I'll talk about this in Discipleship 500, which I'm beginning to write, right? That one disciple, right, can change the world, right, in 33 years. But if a church of 50 goes out, they can change it within the 16 to 17 years. 
I know some of you are like, you're old, you know, what do you really know? But let me tell you, I mean, this is within my lifetime. And most of you are. I was talking to one of my friends, and he was like, hey, you know, what's the age group in your church? And I said, I'm the oldest. <laughs> there might be older people, but I'm the oldest. They don't tell me their age, so I'm just, you know, I'm the oldest. And I love it. Because these young, crazy people, some of you are like in your 40s. You're like, oh, I feel like I'm in my 50s. No, you are in your 40s. <laughs> Believe me, I'm in the 50s. I know what 50s feels like. It doesn't feel like 40s. I mean, sometimes like people in the 30s, oh, I feel like I'm in 50s. No, 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 no. I was 30. I, I understand. <laughs> Do you understand? Like when you're 50 and when you're passionately preaching the word, your congregation is worried whether you're going to have a stroke. <laughs> yeah, really. People come up to me. They're like, you, you okay? I'm like, what are you talking about? You're spirit of God. You know? And when you're 30s, they're like, oh, they call it passion or fashion. Right? He's passionate. And when you're 50, they're like, hey. But I was telling them, these young people are going to transform the world. And we have this mission that within 10 years, we're going to plant 254 churches. And I only want like 100 people in each of those churches. And I believe God can do it by faith because we are devoted to the Great Commission. We'll multiply every year. Every year we'll plant churches. We'll know that as we devote, remember, Great Commission is impossible to fulfill in our own strength. But it is the greatest methodology that God has given to us. That's why Jesus used it. To reach the world. I mean, you, you talk about who can change the world, convert the world in 33. I mean, you talk about what? Google? Apple? Think about it. Who can transform the world in 33 years? Any man, right? You don't even need a college degree. You don't even need a high school degree. You just need a heart. And if your heart can convert, it's the greatest methodology that's why we made it our vision, and then we're saying, hey, we're going to plant churches through the commission. If one person can reach three people, it's not even that first year. And when many of our disciples are beginning to do that, right? And then sometimes if one of them fall away, I'm like, don't worry about it. Just keep going what you're doing. Do you know how valuable? Do you ever, do you ever think, because, you know, when you're like my age, you begin to think about like when you die. Okay? Because my father died, you know, last year in March. When you begin to talk about, do you ever wonder what's going to happen when you're dead? Most people are like, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to talk about that. But I think about like what happens after I die. Everything's going to be fine. All right? My daughter once in a while says, you know, Daddy, I'm going to miss you and all that. But, you know, life will go on and whatever. Do you ever wonder? Because if you're committed to the Great Commission, your account with the Lord is not going to finish. God's going to tell you, right? Your account is not finished. I cannot bless you fully now because you are continuously, your disciples are continuously making disciples. I mean, I can't think of a greater investment. I talk about this all the time, that when you're 50 years old, right, you can't even eat a lot of food, right? Food doesn't really interest you, right? I mean, you have like last thing you kind of hold on to, Right? Car doesn't, your know, house, no, no. You hold on to travel, and then you can't even travel because coronavirus. Right? I mean, your desires change. I mean, what can you hold? You see what a privilege it is to devote yourself to the Great Commission. Somebody was asking, hey, do you know what would happen if you owned Apple stocks at 2000 Do you know how many millions of dollars that you would have today? Can I tell you? If you devote yourself to the Great Commission, can you imagine yourself 20 years later? Can you imagine? Can you just calculate how many disciples you're going to make? How many disciples at the ends of the earth? Can you imagine where you're going? I mean, think about it. Think about the possibility. And let's say you died in year 10. I know you guys are going to there. He goes to, you know, legalists talking about all this. You died here. So what? Your movement continues on. My movement through my daughter and my son and my disciples, those little people that pray behind me, they, it continues. Can you imagine? What, what is greater than that? I know some people are like, well, the great meal at Alinea, really? When I go to Alinea, I've never been there, but you know, they say like 16, 18 courses. I'm like, by course number three, I'm done. It's my six o'clock. I do intermittent fasting by six o'clock. I'm done. I got to go home. 
So I got to fast for 17 hours so that I would, you know, you can see my figure. You know, some of you are like, I was asking my daughter yesterday, can you tell a daughter, can you tell I'm losing weight, I'm shriveling up? And she's like, Dad, you're not. Stop asking me that question. <laughs> you don't imagine. You know, that's what you get when you're in your 50s, right? Some of you are like 40, you think you know. No, no, no. You, like, you look at yourself, what you want to do. You don't care about losing weight. You care about like, losing weight. Because you know what happens when that food goes into your system and digests. Well, you get a belly, and then you got to take the medication, high blood pressure, and then you know, raise your voice, and people are worried about whether you're going to have a stroke or not. See how great great commission is? Some of you that are older, like, you know, that's been coming to this church, I t- say this to 9 o'clock service, all, you should be very proud of UIC movement. You shouldn't hold them tight because it's you who sat here that built that church by you devoting yourself to discipleship. And those younger people came and learned from you and then went out. And then when we're at UIC and you go to South Loop, those are going to be students that come and they're going to go out. And when you're at South Loop and you go to University of Chicago or wherever else we are called to go to, you're going to know that it's because you made this. And then after a while, you're like, what's going on? Well, what's going on is the Great Commission. It's the greatest methodology God has given to us. Right? Some people are still, like I was talking to my friend of mine, after 10 years, he's still looking for a church. Some of us have taken hold of this Great Commission and become mature disciples. We have the ability to make disciples. Do you notice here? Do you, we are asking why the three Ds? We can fulfill the Great Commission. So we're asking, why? Why do we need to devote ourselves to three Ds? Right? To expand again, right? Because one... Disciples will not mature, and because Great Commission will not be fulfilled. And let's ask one more question. How? How do we practice three Ds to expand again? Let me give you three ways real quick. One, by understanding that three Ds are necessary to fulfill the Great Commission. Look at verse 35. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch where they had, and many other taught and preached the Word of God. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns. He's talking about devotionary. Preach the Word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Do you notice? Because I want you to know he's devoted to the word of God. He's determined for his disciples. He's dedicated for the unity of the church in diversity. He knows that without the three Ds, without the devotion by the disciples to the word of God, without it, you cannot fulfill the great commission. Great commission will not happen because we just think it. We just, no, no, we are active participants in the great commission. And the second realize that when we practice the three Ds for the Great Commission, the movement cannot be stopped. Look at verse 41. This is after having an argument. Do you notice here? They had an argument. They go their separate ways, but do you notice verse 41? He went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. What you realize, and, and this is really amazing, because you know, my, yesterday my daughter was asking, we were watching kind of the national football, the playoffs, and I was telling my daughter, I said, there's no sport that is decided by coaching and quarterback or one player like football. Baseball, even if you have the best pitcher and best manager, you can't win every year. Basketball, unless you have the best player, even if you don't have great coach, if you have the best player, that coach can become. But football, more than any other sport, okay, needs the coach and then coach on the field called quarterback. Why? Everything is decided by the coach And the coach on the field called quarterback in order for it to win. It's very much like the Great Commission. Everything is decided in the Great Commission by the discipler. The devotion, determination, dedication of the discipler. And the same thing, the disciples. Devotion, dedication, uh, determination, dedication of the disciple. Everything determines on that. Because why? If you are devoted, determined, and you cannot be stopped. That's what you're going to read. The movement cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped. It doesn't stop in Europe. It always comes all the way over here. Now it's going to go to It cannot be stopped. Great Commission, if we are practicing it, guys, you, when I'm inviting you to Great Commission, I'm telling you, right, to a movement that cannot be stopped. And then one more. By practicing three Ds for disciples one day at a time. Acts chapter 16, he goes in the trip. Very first thing he does, 16.1, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where the disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was Jewish and believer, a believer whose father was a Greek. Do you know the very first thing that Paul does? And I need to say this because, you know, when we talk about the Great Commission, right? The idea of Great Commission is easy. 
living it out one day at a time, very, very difficult, right? When we never get into discipleship, you'll never become a disciple, a mature disciple. When you never invest into a disciple, you'll never make disciples. The idea is very, very easy, but we have to do it one day at a time. Do you know the very thing that Paul does? He goes, he lets go of John Mark. Very first thing he does, he picks up this disciple named Timothy and begins to invest in him. In fact, it's going to be his pattern. Every time he goes to a city, he'll, he's, he'll leave Timothy when he has to go to another city. And he will continue on the work. And what you see is the Great Commission cannot be stopped. In fact, as he devotes himself to discipleship one day at a time. Guys, this is the beginning of the year 2022. By end of the year, I don't know where the Great Commission is going to take us. But let me tell you, we devote today to discipleship. We pray one day at a time. We study the Word of God one day at a time. We invest in a disciple one day at a time. We grow as a disciple in one day at a time, and then Lord will do what He will do with us. Let's pray together. Lord, remind us that we can expand again. And remind us, Lord, that it is the greatest thing that we can do to pay a part with you as you expand your kingdom in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue to have a worship as we present our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And give through the app, through Zell, or if you brought your physical offering, you can drop it in the basket. Let's stand. Sing a response. To the call that he has placed upon you and I. Yeah.
We trust you that your wings are higher than all. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you. Expand again and again and again. We want to see you fulfill the Great Commission in our generation. Expand again and again and again and again so that the disciples will know that indeed you will convert this whole world for you and you will receive all glory and honor. And teach us some of the older people to know that the great commission that you have called us to, the same call goes out to us even at our older age. Remind us how young we are, how capable we are if we will submit and walk with you. So now may the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of the Father and fellowship of your Holy Spirit be with this community now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Good morning, New Community Church. Good morning. Such a blessing and privilege and honor to be able to worship with you today, especially if it was your first time or if you're a newcomer. We want to welcome you. I would love to get to know you. There's some, um, there's some food or snacks or refreshments in the back. Connect with you and fellowship after um, the benediction. Um, Friday Bible study groups are back, back in full effect. I thought there was a mini church in the back. Um, within one group and the group right here in the New Testament, I was listening as I was just cleaning up on Friday. I was being so blessed um, by the study of the word there. If you're interested um, in studying Romans or New Testament survey, please reach out to one of the small group leaders um, on the app. <clears throat> Discipleship 200 will be offered uh, starting on January 21st, which is next Friday. If you're interested in learning more about your spiritual gifts, um, how God has called you to serve. Uh, please sign up through the app, or you can reach out to Pastor Frank. As always, Tuesdays and Fridays, where our prayer meetings here, I would love to pray with you and grow with you in that. So if you're able to come at 630, we'd love uh, to pray with you together. With our churches being two campuses, I'm going to keep saying this. Um, there are a lot of places to serve. And by serve, I'm not saying, you know, we want to put you to work and, you know, like over. No, we want you to grow in your spiritual gifts. So if you're interested in, in helping out with welcoming or with fellowship or with camera production, even on even worship, please come speak to uh, one of the um, heads of the uh, department, heads of those ministries. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to worshiping with you again 
next Sunday if we don't see you 205. Thank you.